everyone. Thank you so much for attending this uh, seminar. So I want you to get three things out of this seminar. So the first is what is an associate? So a bit of associateship, so a bit of a better idea of what the role of a judge's associate is. The second thing is an understanding of the application process. So if you think that, you know, you might be interested, how do you apply? When do you apply? What will be the, what um, will the process be like? And the third objective is to give you an idea of what uh, makes a strong candidate. So if you are thinking that a judge's associate might be a, a good option for you, how do you make your application stand out of the crowd because they are quite competitive. And to assist me uh, in, in all in this endeavor, I have got a number of wonderful, wonderful ANU alum who have very generously agreed to come on board tonight and share their experiences with you. Um, so they've all been judges associates in different capacities. So we've got Maddie Winterbottom uh, who uh, started off her career as a graduate in Herbert Smith Freehills, and she took a year out to do an associateship at the Sydney District Court. Uh, we've got Kate Martin, who at the moment is an associate to Justice Mossop in the ACT Supreme Court. We've also got Alexandra Proudford, who is um, who started off uh, in insurance litigation at Norton Rose Fulbright, but is now at the Federal Court of Australia as an associate uh, there. We've also got with us this evening, Naomi Wooten, who's a barrister at the New South Wales Bar. So she has previously uh, worked as the tip staff to Chief Justice of the New South Wales Supreme Court, the research director to the Chief Justice. Um, and she's also been associate um, at the High Court of Australia to Justice Bell. And finally, we've got Jessica Elliott and I have to um, big thanks to Jessica who was really, um, uh, really helped me in putting um, this panel together. So she is, she has been the tip staff to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New South Wales and the, is now the research director to the Chief Justice. Excellent. So um, the first question I'm going to put to the panel is to help us out a little bit with the terminology. So just in that list of introduction, you've heard judges associate, tip staff, uh, research director, and I I'm just wanting each of the panelists to say what, what is their formal term? What is the term that is used in their, in their court? Uh, so I'll start off with uh, Jessica. Um, she can let us know about what this tip staff means and, and, the, and the director of research. Um, yeah, so in the New South Wales Supreme Court, they use um, tip staff to refer to the position that um, is generally someone legally trained, um, you know, generally a law grad or someone close, um, close to graduating. And um, so that's a tip staff. And then an associate is also used, and that's used for someone that generally stays at the court for a much longer time, um, is generally not legally trained. Um, and generally has more of a secretarial role. So um, it's, it's really hard to keep track, but it's generally tip staff in New South Wales Supreme Court for the, for the roles that most law students would be wanting to, to apply for. Yep. Uh, and what's this position of uh, Chief uh, uh, Director of Research? That's just unique to um, the Chief Justice's chamber. Um, in the Supreme Court, there's also a few researcher positions. So there's a common law researcher, an equity researcher, court of appeal researcher, and then um, the position I'm in, research director. So there's a few research positions as well. Okay. And, and Maddie, I might go to you in the uh, district court. So what's the, the, so the New South Wales district court, uh, you're based, you were based in Sydney. What's the terminology that's used there? So each judge in the district court just has an associate and it kind of depends on the judge. Um, with what the role is. So with my judge, it was more of a tip staff position. She has one associate every year and they're legally trained and they do research, but other judges have an associate, which is more similar to the Supreme Court. They're not legally trained, but they stay there for a very long time and they help the judge with admin. So it, yeah, my role was kind of a mix of the associate and tip staff position of the Supreme Court. 
Um, and we'll go to Alexander now because he's in the federal court. So what are the terminologies used in the federal court, Alexander? What we have here, we have associates. So that's akin to what the Supreme Court call a tippy or a tip staff. Um, that's someone that's legally trained and provides judges with legal assistance as well as kind of the practice management assistance in court. Um, and then we have EAs, which are just executive assistants. They kind of help with the management of the judge's personal diary or any of the kind of um, regular secretarial work that is in chambers. Okay. An associate is akin to a tippy or a tip staff. <laughs> okay. And um, Kate, what is this? Is that um, similar to the ACT Supreme Court? How does it work there? Uh, yeah, so it's similar to how um, Alex has explained for the federal court. So most judges um, in the ACT Supreme Court have two associates who operate um, in the way described as a tip staff uh, by uh, Jessica and the New South Wales Supreme Court. Um, typically, the associates at the ACT Supreme Court stay for about 12 months each. Um, some associates are admitted to um, practice as solicitors, but others um, haven't been admitted yet. So it's a mix of um, those more legal type roles and also um, administrative roles as well shared between the two associates in chambers. Yeah, but the term tip staff isn't used? No, just the term associate. Okay. And Naomi, it'd be interesting to hear about your experience with the High Court. So what, what's the terminology used there? So it's the same as the federal court. So you sort of think about it as another federal jurisdiction. It's associate. Um, is used to describe the legally trained role. Um, so, and that's someone who stays normally for one year. Some judges, it would be 18 months. And then um, some of the judges actually have the position of senior associate, not all of them. And I don't think um, routinely, but that is often legally trained as well, but takes on some admin tasks. Um, and then the judges all also have an executive assistant or a personal assistant who wouldn't be legally trained, stays with the judge for a long time, um, and so it would fulfil the role of an associate in the Supreme Court. Okay, excellent. So my next question, I think I'll stay with you, uh, Naomi, is just if you could give us an idea of your, what, are, what is the role that you do as an, as an associate? So your day-to-day -day role, what were the types of things that you were doing? So Naomi, could you speak about your experience in the High Court? Uh, yep, so uh, to a certain extent, your day-to-day -day role is really determined by the judge. Um, so my experience might not be the same as for everyone, um, but definitely you go to court. So um, you, anyone who's watched the um, high court ABLs would see the little people sitting behind the judges on the chairs. And so um, anytime court's sitting, you're also sitting in court and sit behind the judge with the materials for the case. And you would be um, across those materials and passing things forward to the judge um, as required, or if something's required out of court, you would go run and get in and come back in. That generally doesn't happen too often because there's um, sets of CLRs and stuff in court. So um, that's normally that. And and then anytime you're not um, in court, it's it's really up to the judge. Um, often things that associates do involve proofreading judgments, um, doing a lot of research tasks, um, reading over, you know, the submissions and things and summarising things. And it might just be um, the particular judge will want you to do, you know, a memo on this particular issue. Um, so some people do a lot of written memos. Some people do a lot of oral sort of discussion with their judge about cases, um, but it's heavy, you know, a heavy amount of legal research. Okay, excellent. And Maddie, I might go to you now about um, your position, your experience in the district court. What was your day-to-day -day role and um, especially the, the way it may have differed from Nomi's description of the high court? <laughs> yeah, um, similar to Naomi, we were in court every day that our judges are and in the criminal court if you have a criminal court judge that means you're in court a lot whereas if you work for a judge who's in the civil um, law side of the district court then often cases settle more and you're in court less but um, there's a lot of trial management that goes into working for a criminal law judge so you're always trying to keep on top of the MFIs and exhibits, um, the parties will send you any correspondence that they need to have with the judge and sometimes it also involves um, making chambers orders when there's like an urgent order that the, they need to have made outside of court. 
Um, but yeah, it really depends on the judge. Like my judge also was did a lot of policy work because um, she was involved in rolling out a special evidence program for children. So there were implementation meetings and contributions to policy papers and research that I had to help her with as well. Um, and associates to other judges didn't have to do that. So yeah, it, it really depends, but it can be anything. You're just like their assistant for life. <laughs> Yeah. And Alexander, how does it work in the federal court? What is, what is your day-to-day -day role? Um, it's very similar to what's been described so far. So I usually try and split it as a 50-50 between legal and then practice management. In terms of the legal work that we do, there is anything from memos to, um, you know, proofing judgments to even writing portions of judgments, those types of things. Um, and then the other half would be the kind of practice management, which really is very similar to being in a firm as a solicitor. You've got to be across the matters. You deal in field with all of the emails. So no, no parties ever email the judge directly. They email you and you're kind of the conduit. You assess emails and kind of figure out, is this something that needs to be raised with her honour or I deal with this or those types of things. Being in court as well, it's a little bit different from... Um, the Supreme Court, we sit kind of in front, which is where their associate sits. And the so, yeah, both associates, I'm an associate and their associates sit in front, um, or the usually sits over to the side. So we're the person kind of in front that gets some hands up documents, swears in witnesses, kind of keeps track of everything as well, making sure that it's all running smoothly. I like to also take my own notes just so that if anything pops up or, for example, if judge asks a question later about something, I can always refer back to my notes and have a quick flick. Um, but, yeah, as has been said by um, Naomi and Maddie, it's very chambers dependent, which is one of the things that I think you'll probably hear a lot from tonight. It is very chambers dependent. If your judge particularly has a lot of you know, extracurricular things that they like doing, perhaps then maybe you'll be involved in speech writing or things like that. But if they don't do a lot or they don't sit on a lot of external boards, then you won't. Or if they have a small docket or a small, you know, case list, you might not be in court as often. Whereas, for example, my judge, Justice Jago, she actually has quite a large docket. So I think this year so far, we've only had two out of court days with no listings. So that's quite different from other associates in the federal court who you know, haven't had um, perhaps hearings longer than one week, whereas we've had six, seven week hearings that are quite regular. So yeah, very chambers dependent, but like I said, the 50-50 split. Excellent. And now I'll go um, to uh, Kate. I don't think we've heard from you yet. And then and then Jessica. So the the, the Supreme Courts um, of, of the ACT in New South Wales. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think my sort of day-to-day -day sounds a lot like um, what's being described already. Uh, so you sort of divide in terms of your time spent in court and then your time spent in chambers. Uh, in court, um, the, the, the main task really is recording the orders, um, ensuring that um, any evidence tendered is um, logged and organised. Uh, and then in terms of this, what happens in chambers, a lot of uh, judgment proofing, um, some research, uh, managing um, the inbox, which of course is the communication to chambers in relation to parties seeking in chambers orders, um, communications with the registry about uh, the progression of matters, those sorts of things, um, dealing with some listings of matters, uh, and then assisting judge with um, whatever else um, they may need. So. Um, as has been discussed, some judges sit on committees which um, involve some work, others don't. Um, but yes, um, I think the, the largest task in terms of being um, when you're not in court, I think for me, has been uh, judgment proofing. Excellent. And, and Jess, just over to you um, quickly about would you, would you have anything to add? Is there anything that you sort of do in your day to day role that hasn't been discussed yet? No, I guess I would just say it's very similar. I would just say probably from the Supreme Court, it very much um, depends on what division you're in. So I'm in the appeals um, kind of division of the, so the New South Wales Court of Appeal um, and your day-to-day -day would look very different if you were with, for example, a trial judge in the common law um, or uh, an, a judge in the equity division that, you know, is running the commercial list, for example. Um, but I think yeah, it's generally, you know, kind of getting the judge you work for ready before court and making sure the materials are ready and authorities and things like that and then, sitting in court um, and, you know, helping if needs be or, or just listening and trying to follow along and then equally um, at the end kind of proofing and doing any research that may come. 
be necessary. Okay, and so some one things that the the students might uh, students might be thinking is well. How do I know, you know, which uh, which court I, I want to apply for? What are the pros and cons? We obviously, yeah, Maddie spoke about the difference between criminal law and, and civil law, and Jessica to, um, talked about the difference between the the appeals um, chamber. And so, I guess it, I'd be interested in your reflections on what are the pros and cons of being in your particular court and in your particular role, and and how would students know, like how would, um, you know, for example, when they're applying, I mean, how would they know whether the particular judge is, you know, does more criminal law cases or does more civil law cases or how would the students know whether, um, you know, what type of judge to approach, whether, you know, that sort of associateship is going to to suit them. Um, so I may, may hand over to Kate first. Uh, well, I think one of the really nice things about the ACT Supreme Court is that it has um, quite a varied jurisdiction in the sense in the ACT, of course, there's no separate court of appeal. So the Supreme Court justices um, sit um, as the court of appeal, which means that you've got um, time to sit um, when the Supreme Court sits in both the civil and the criminal capacity. And then you also get to sit when uh, three judges sit in an appellate capacity, which is uh, really interesting to see um, that a varied jurisdiction uh, it also brings across um, a really wide range of different interesting matters, um, varying um, different levels of skill of counsel. Um, you get some more impressive counsel coming in for Court of Appeal, for example. Um, so that was one of the things I have really enjoyed about um, my associateship at the ACT a Supreme Court in that it's been uh, very wide in terms of being able to see both civil and criminal and then also um, the trial level and the appellate level of the court's operation. Excellent. And Alexandra, I hand over to you for the federal court. So what's what's the what's the benefit of being a federal court associate? Um, well, one of the reasons I specifically applied is that I really enjoy the federal jurisdiction. So I enjoyed things like administrative, public, constitutional law at, at uni. Um, and those are the kind of things that we deal with quite regularly in the federal court. But we also get lots of very kind of heavy uh, evidence-based hearing. So it's not just all appellate looking for any kind of errors in um, previous decisions. You are dealing with it at first instance as well. So you're dealing with first instance um, defamation all the way through to some corpse matters, some migration where you get a bit of admin law in there. Then you get some, um, God, what else do we do? IP, tax. Like there's lots of different areas that kind of can, that have like piqued my interest, for example. Some um, Pros of being in, oh, sorry, no, some cons, because I think that's what everybody really wants to hear. Um, some cons of being in, I don't know if it's if it's particular to the federal court, but I would say working in court, because I've previously come from a law firm and then now I'm here at the court. So I would say it's a very small team. It's literally just me, judge, and the EA. So it is a very different experience from being in a law firm where perhaps in your team you have 20 people, three partners, 10 essays, that type of thing. And you can kind of socially interact just incidentally by just being surrounded by people. It is very small. So it is that, that is also a pro in itself because you feel very connected, but it is something that is entirely different from being in a corporate firm or perhaps a larger entity. You do kind of feel a little bit like, like, like some people often say, you're like behind the curtain. You're not seen or you're not, it's, it's very much just, three people that kind of work together closely. So it's a, it's a bit of a different interaction feel year. So that's what I'd say is a con. Again, I don't know if it's just particular the federal court. It's probably everybody, but yeah, that's what I would probably say for that one. Excellent. And um, Maddie, I'll go to you. I'd be really interested in hearing your experiences in the district court mm -hmm. and why you're attracted to the district court and what you think that experience may have given you that you wouldn't have got if you were in, let's say, Supreme Court or the High Court. Yeah, so my um, other degree at uni was psychology. And um, like you said in your intro, I'm working at Herbert Smith Freehills right now, but I was kind of, I got to a point where I was thinking maybe I was interested in switching to criminal law. So that's why I applied to a criminal law judge in the district court. Um, I, I, I mean, I can't, 
I can't really compare to the experience of associates and tip staff at other courts because I don't know, but I do think what you get to see in the district court is just like trials from start to finish, all kinds of advocacy, and also you do a lot of um, sentencing work with your judge, writing a lot of sentences or drafting them for your judge to then fiddle with the numbers and put in the facts and stuff. Um, and appeal work from the local court. So you just see such a range of criminal matters and it's pretty crazy. Like you're constantly trying to juggle lots of different matters. So I think it's absolutely the best option if you're interested in criminal law or just want to see a lot of advocacy. Um, Yeah. The other thing which I really enjoyed about the district court is that we go on circuit a lot. I know other um, courts do, but I don't know how much, whereas we, I went on circuit mainly to Newcastle every month for a week at a time. Um, And it's just you and your judge traveling. So if you get along with your judge, it's great. (laughs) Um, Which brings me to the point of really do your research about your judge and speak to anyone you know because yeah like you've just got to get along with your judge yeah no I think that's a really good point and and finally I'll go to Naomi if you could sort of compare and contrast the associate role in the high court uh with the supreme court um supreme court of New South Wales it'd be interesting to hear what were the pros and cons of both different courts um well I think Actually, because I was like Jess in the Court of Appeal in the Supreme Court, it was almost quite similar um, in the High Court because they're just, you know, both appellate jurisdictions, although um, the High Court does have original jurisdiction, but we it has a bit more of an appellate feel the way that the original jurisdiction works anyway. You're not finding facts um, generally. And so, uh, or def- at least not in the year I was there, I think in the const- uh, the citizenship year there was a lot of fact finding but um, that was a bit of an anomaly and so um, I I think my experience was actually very similar what I would say is I think um, Maddie's absolutely right about what the difference is between the two the two experiences um, and just that you will get a far more diverse experience the lower you kind of go in the judicial hierarchy Um, and so I what my advice to people would not be that, you know, um, being at the Supreme Court is necessarily better in any way than being at the district court or being on the Court of Appeal is any way better than being in the trial division of the Supreme Court um, because you actually see a lot more in the trial divisions is my, in my view. You'll just see far more cases um, and you'll also see far more of the things that if you are interested in litigation or you are interested in going to the bar, that's actually what you'd be doing. You're not going to be arguing an appeal in the Court of Appeal Um you know, in your first probably 10 years. I think um, that's, it it can be really beneficial to actually think about, well, what do I actually want to get out of this? Um, As opposed to what's the, what what do people say is more prestigious and, and channel it that way. And there are often stories of uh, of people doing both, you know, doing a year at a district court and then another year in a Supreme Court, maybe in the appellate jurisdiction as well. So um, that's quite common. But I think what we'll turn to now is this, the process. Um, so how do you how do you apply? What are the questions, you know, you should be asking? Maddie's already raised that really important issue of you've got to do a bit of background research on your judge to the extent that you can. Um, but I'll go to Jessica for this. So, I mean, what, what was the process um, for you? Like, when did you apply? How did you apply? If you could give us a little bit more information on that, that would be great. So speaking from the perspective of the, the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Well, the application process entirely depends on the judge. So it's there's no standardised process. Um, and so what that actually means is that you need to individually contact each chamber generally. Um, so a few judges will publicly advertise. So the Chief Justice, for example, um, is definitely in the minority in that he will send out an, uh, an advertisement to universities um, and publish it on, you know, Wattle or things like that. Um, but generally most judges don't do that. Um, so... I would recommend that you would contact the judges that you want um, and, you know, that doesn't mean sending out an email to all, you know, 50 judges. Um, it would mean 
you know, probably targeting a specific area, you know, whether you want trial experience or appellate experience or, or whatever, um, asking them if they have any availabilities, um, what, um, I guess, when is the next available position, you know, when are applications due, what would they like um, for you to submit? Um, and then it very much depends on the judge and generally they'll just do a kind of quite a casual interview. Um, and I guess in terms of timeline, um, at the very... It, it, at the very latest, it does depend, but probably the very latest you would be applying early at the very, very start of the year before you would start. So, you know, perhaps in January, Feb for the year later, um, but more often, but def there are definitely times when it would be earlier than that. So I would recommend doing it, um, contacting at least probably a year and a half, I don't know, maybe I'm being a bit conservative, but a year and a half out from where you would start. So, you know, mid the year before, um, because some judges definitely will hire, um, you know, in October for the year subsequent. And in fact, the Chief Justice hires even earlier than that. So um, definitely kind of think about it earlier than you would think, because they, they do happen um, quite early. Okay, excellent. And Kate, I'll go to you now. Is that a similar process for the ACT Supreme Court? Kate, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Um, it's a slightly different process uh, in the ACT Supreme Court in that um, the application is more centralised. So uh, when I applied and in the application stream that's just happened, you apply to, um, we send an email to the um, EA, to the Chief Justice, who is also the Chamber's manager. Uh, and then there's a sort of a centralised register in which the applications go on. And then from there, um, the Chambers will um, have a look at the applications and the judges will decide uh, individually who they would like to interview um, from that pool. So um, in the ACT Supreme Court, we don't need to uh, email all the judges separately or whichever judges you'd be interested in, but rather apply to that um, to that central uh, register. And that's usually advertised. Um, I know that the court usually sends that notification to, um, to the law school um, when the hiring usually occurs, but there's also information on the court website, I believe, as to applying. Excellent, thanks. And Alexander, how about the federal court? How does it work there? Quite similarly, um, the federal court's quite transparent on its website under each of the judges' bios. It tells you the roles that are available and when they're available from um, and how to apply. So they'll say what you need. For example, it's usually just a CV, cover letter and transcripts. And you usually send that, you know, to the attention of just as such and such and send that to the registra, uh, the registry and then they forward it on to chambers. We all compile it, that type of thing. But each judge has their own profile on the federal court website that will outline exactly what you need to do and what, what, what it's open for. As Jess said, sometimes, um, for example, Justice Jago, we've actually filled up until 2022. So for the next one is 2023. Um, but some judges might have availabilities next year. It's just having a quick scroll of the federal court website and seeing what's available. Okay. And Maddie, how about the district court? How did it work for you? Oh, it's a bit more of a mess, unfortunately. Um, you, similar to the Supreme Court, you contact the judges directly, but you can also contact the registry, the district court registry. There's a um, woman called Betty there who receives all the CVs and then if a judge puts up their hand to her and says I need a new associate she'll pass those CVs on to the judge who needs a new associate. Something that is both a positive and a negative thing I guess about applying to the district court is that it's not as strict on timing so you you just kind of have to luck in, shoot emails off and if the judge needs an associate soon, they'll get back to you saying, yes, um, send me your CV or come in for an interview because associates can come and leave whenever they want. Like my judge said, you, you can stay for a year, you can stay for a year and a half. It's not like every spot opens up in March. So it's, it's, luck of the draw but that can be a good thing because it can also be a numbers game yeah okay thanks and then Naomi just finally to you I'm sure everyone's very uh, interested to know how what's the process of getting a uh, associate ship in the High Court of Australia um it, again it's different for every judge unhelpfully um I think on the last time I looked which is a while ago the High Court website has some information about um, the judges that have specific 
kind of requirements or prerequisites. The judges that don't have those things, um, it's just a matter of contacting chambers, asking when the judge is next hiring, um, and then effectively sending through a CV. Um, my, I mean, the, the way that I sort of got the associateship is almost quite strange. I had applied um, years before at the same time I'd applied for the Chief Justice, had got the Chief Justice role and taken it um, and Justice Bell had filled, at the time I applied, it was, it's just a matter of luck and timing. She'd filled the positions and so said, um, no, no thanks, sorry. And um, a few months into my job at the Supreme Court, I got an email saying, oh, we still have your CV and Justice Bell is appointing again. Would you like to come in for an interview? Um, and so I, you know, kind of had put it from my mind, didn't intend to sort of apply again. And um, it just happened that it worked out and she was hiring for the year that I finished, the year when I would have finished with the Chief Justice. So um, I did the interview and took the job when, when it was offered. Um, but I think if you look at the High Court website, a few of the judges have some requirements. I think it, my impression is it's definitely tending more towards um, you need to have done a few other things before you um, apply. So I don't know that many, I, I, I think that some of the judges still hire people directly out of university, but it would definitely be a minority. It was probably only one or two associates who were directly out of university. For most of them, um, they sort of would expect a few years of practice, um, maybe another associateship, maybe a postgraduate degree. So um, that being said, I didn't have a postgraduate degree, so um, it's, it's not a prerequisite. Excellent. Okay, so now we'll go to what I think will be the final question before I open it up to, um, to the students to ask you questions directly, and we've already got a few of them. Uh, what do you think, what can students do to put themselves in a really strong position to get an associateship? So what can they do right from now, like even if they're in first year? You know, is there, is there something they could be doing now? Uh, first or second years um, to give them that competitive edge right to, you know, when you first contact the judge or the chambers via email to your CV, your cover letter, uh, even to the interview. So, so what advice would you give to someone who really wants an associateship? Uh, what are the do's and don'ts? And Alexander, I'll go to you first. Um, okay, so I would say in terms of what you can do now as a first, second, very early career law student is one, enjoy your time at law school. Don't, you know, take everything really too seriously. Just like make sure you have a nice time as well. Um, grades are obviously important. Uh, so I don't think anyone would say that they're not. Grades are definitely important, especially when you have, a, you know, a huge stack of CDs that all have amazing marks. It's hard to stand out, right? It is really hard. Um, I would say try and get some diverse experience and figure out whilst you're at law school what you're actually interested in and what you want to do. Um, I, I feel that there are a lot of people, especially in, you know, the cohort that I was in, that when I was going through law school, lots of people spoke about associateships because it's like the prestigious thing to do. But if you're actually not interested in doing that and you're actually really interested in doing I don't know, just something that is completely different, for example, then you don't have to do it just because it's the done prestigious thing and it's got this very exclusive title. Really think about in your first years about what you actually want from the law and what you enjoy, whether that's, you know, as Maddie was saying, you really enjoy criminal law. It's like, well, then don't look at the federal court because we don't do criminal law, you know. So don't, don't apply to us. Don't apply to the high court unless, you know, you want that kind of very upper appellate level work. If you want criminal like grassroots criminal stuff, go to your local, go to your district, even some of the Supreme Court, that's probably where you want to go. So that's what I'd say, figure out your interests and your likes. In terms of the actual application, it's very different, again, from corporate and clerkships and anything like that. You've still got the classic CV, cover letter and um, transcript, but each judge is so particular. I would say research the judge, look into their swearing in um, speeches, look into any presentations that they've given, look into their background, what they're kind of interested in and what their areas are. In the federal court, you can actually look up and see what national practice areas each judge is actually um, relevant to and their, docu their docket is relevant to. Um, don't necessarily apply to um, a judge that doesn't do native title and then in your cover letter say, I'm very interested in doing native title because the federal court is, it's like, it's not relevant to that particular judge. Um, especially because there are such a high number of applications, something that is important is attention to detail. So make sure there aren't errors. 
You know, it is really, I know that sounds really obvious, but the smallest spelling mistakes and errors, if you've got a large pool of applications that you're trying to get through, that's one of the first things you'll look like. If you've all got very similar marks or you've got similar experiences, if there are errors, you've got to find something to pull people apart. Make sure that that is really, really finessed, especially because it's an early example of how well you can proof a judgment. You don't want a judgment being published that has spelling errors or anything like that in it. Um, but yeah, also chat with current associates as well. That's something that I did and like figure out which courts for you by chatting to people, you know, like the people that are on this panel, like um, try and email them or message them or just get a kind of vibe of what their everyday is and what their work is. Don't feel kind of too anxious or scared about contacting chambers. We are people as well who are young professionals, young lawyers, you know, so pick up the phone and call chambers and say, hey, are you actually accepting any applications yet? Or, you know, feel free to call. I remember being in law school and thinking that was a really scary thing to do because, you know, it's a judge's chambers, but you won't be put through to the judge directly. It's just little old me on the other end of the phone. So just feel free to pick up the phone and have a chat. So yeah, attention to detail. Um, find out what you really like at law school and apply to the relevant jurisdictions. Do your research and talk to people who have done it before. You might get a lot of phone calls over the next few days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll <laughs> insert my details. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, Jessica, how about I go to you? What would be your advice about what students can do now to give themselves a bit of a competitive edge, but also, you know, when going through the actual process, what are the do's and don'ts from your from your perspective? Um, so I guess firstly, as to what people can do now, I think similar to AJ in terms of figuring out, um, you know, if you can, what, what you actually like. And I think the reason why I was quite certain that I wanted to do, um, you know, a typical kind of associate position was because I was very interested in advocacy and, um, you know, was thinking maybe it create the bar and I, I liked that side to it. And I think, um, you know, doing, for example, even, you know, mooting competitions and I worked um, at a barrister's chambers and things like that helped me um, along the way figure out that this is something that I do really like and um, I guess kind of solidified why I wanted to do it. And I think that's something that, um, you know, equally you shouldn't just be doing it to be associate position just because, you, you know, you think it's the right thing to do and, and unpack why you want to do it. And I think that's also equally persuasive is that if when you do contact a judge or an, in a cover letter or an interview, you can say and quite clearly, you know, explain, well, I want to do this because I'm really interested in these areas of law and I'd like to go to the bar or I'd like a career in this and, you know, working with you and seeing advocacy in front of me or, you know, seeing how a trial unfolds will really assist me in, in this, for example. Um, and so I think, yeah, things that expose you to, you know, to help you figure out what you'd like to do are really helpful. Um, I guess so practically I think um, work, you know, editing on a law review, federal law review or yearbook of um, international law, they're kind of helpful things that, um, you know, can sh help you demonstrate that you're good at proofing, for example, and, and um, that's a large part of the role. Um, and I guess in terms of tips and tricks and applying, um, I got in contact, you know, cold um, emailed um, someone that had had the position before um, and asking, because I just wanted to find out a bit more about the judge. And I think it's it's sometimes quite hard to figure that out. And um, so definitely get in contact with anyone you know and don't be afraid to, you know, call the chambers to reach out to, to um, someone you vaguely know and, um, you know, try and get the lay of the land a little bit about whether they'd be a good person to work for. Because it, as AJ said, or maybe I can't remember, it is such an individual role and you're in such a small chambers. Um, so, you know, that will really make or break your experience. Um, yeah. Excellent. So we have got a, and a question come through on Q&A. And so I might, um, so it's, it's what kind of experience or skills would you suggest emphasising in your cover letter? Um, so I might put that to Kate specifically. Do you have... Um, so what do you think makes a great cover letter in an application for a judge's associate? Uh, well, I think the first thing is um, really pay attention to the criteria um, for the cover letter, which will be advertised on the um, position advertisement. So it's really important that you try and focus on those particular skills. As has been discussed um, in the previous question, um, proofreading and research is um, something that is um, really important. So uh, trying to think about ways in which you can really address um, that particular criteria, I think is a essential one because proofing judgments is such a large part of the job. Um, so but that would be one thing. Uh, and then also in terms of your cover, your CV and, uh, and your cover letter, it is important to remember that um, you, you shouldn't lose sight of being able to put a little bit of yourself into it. Uh, so um, once you get to the point, for example, where you have an interview, um, 
all of the candidates that will be offered an interview probably can do the job. They're all intelligent people who have had really good experience. So what it comes down to at that point is, um, to a certain extent, does the judge think that you are a, a nice and interesting person that they would be happy to work in um, quite close um have a quite a close working relationship with. So it's important that you're able to uh, bring to the application a part of yourself um, and show that you are a multifaceted, interesting person who um, not only uh, can do the job and do it well, but can also be someone that is genuinely uh, in in interesting and um, nice to have around chambers. So don't lose sight of putting yourself into it. I'm muted. Sorry about that. Um, I'll, I've just got one more piece of advice to add from my experiences doing references for um, judges associateship positions. And then I think we'll open up. So we're getting, please put your questions through now. I think we've, um, uh, uh, yes, we're going to, to that next stage. But look, I get a lot of calls from judges. Um, uh, from students who have put me down as a referee and there are two questions that the judges tend to ask it's not about your marks it's not about how much you know about the law they've got your transcript uh, they can see that one thing they ask me is how well does this person respond to feedback uh, and they want to know that you can deal with feedback, you can deal with it emotionally, you know, you're not going to break down and cry if the if the judge sort of, you know, tells you that the, you know, research or proofing wasn't quite up to scratch. But also how, how well are you able to um, take the feedback and then, you know, really show that you've taken it on board by giving them something the next day, you know, that that's actually changed. Um, so a, a really good thing to do, I think, is to do research electives. Um, I, we had the honours degree. I know it's called something else now, but there are lots of opportunities to work with academics at the ANU um, to do research. Um, so, so that really enables me as your referee to be able to give that feedback. You know, yes, I told you know, Sarah, you know, that she needed to work on this and the next draft I saw that she really had worked on it. Um, and the, and so that that's one piece of advice. Um, so there's lots of um, it, opportunities at the ANU to work quite closely with academic members of staff. Um, so through doing an honours project, a research project, by being a research assistant to a staff member, uh, by doing something like um, the Jessup Moot or a clinical subject where you're working quite closely um, to an academic at the ANU. Um, the other thing I'd say is that what judges ask me about is how well do they work in a team? They're wanting to know that you aren't going to upset um, any one of their staff members, you know, uh, that you're not going to be sort of a bit uh, abrupt in, in your manner, that you're someone who can just get along with people. And um, yes, you're, you're someone who's going to be nice and easy to work with. So, and so again, doing lots of, it sounds corny, I know, but teamwork activities like mooting um, or, or clinical subjects where you're working with uh, other students, but you're also working quite closely with an ANU staff member, puts you in a good position where you've got a referee who can speak to those teamwork skills. Um, so that's what I'll say. But look, um, we've got a few questions coming in now. So I think I'll go from the bottom to the top only because the bottom ones are a bit more general. Um, but we've got a question. What, um, what kind of questions did your judge ask at the interview? Could you tell us a bit more about the interview process? Um, so I think that's a good one. So Maddie, how about we go to you? So what, what would be your advice about the interview, what sort of questions did you get and, and how would you, um, what advice would you give about the interview? I think, um, so I've seen two interviews, mine and the interview of the associate who replaced me. And what is telling is like everyone else has said, they're not looking to find out what your contract's mark was. They, my judge pinpointed, I had like kind of a weird line on my CV saying what my interests were like rock climbing and blah 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 and she zoned in on that one and we had a just a chat about what I like to do outside of working at Free Hills so I think that really shows that they're looking for someone who they will enjoy traveling with and working every day with um and they can have a laugh with. Uh, it was a really, really casual interview. And that's what I've heard other people say as well. They don't ask a lot of questions. It's not going to be a law exam. They just want to see if they gel with you. 
Um, so I think the interview, yes, interviews can be nerve wracking, but it's not the thing to worry about. It's all the things that you do to get to that point that I think make the difference. Absolutely. Okay, so I think I'll go with that question about interviews to um, to Naomi. Uh, to know me so the experience of what what about the high court in particular was that quite different to what Maddie was explaining not at all um so I, it almost exactly the same um and my my interview with the supreme court and and the high court was basically the same so it's just it is really a matter of is this person someone I can spend time with or are they going to be insufferable? And particularly with the high court, I mean, we travelled together. Um, so if, for my judge, you spend six months in Canberra and then six months in Sydney. And we travelled from Sydney to Canberra for sittings together. And so you're spending a lot of time, you know, next to each other on a plane, um, waiting in the airport, in cars. That's what they really want to know. Whether you, you know, the, the, that you can do the job gets you in the door. Um what, from that point onwards, it's are you an okay person um, to hang out with? And I think what I would say on that particularly, and, and this is something that um, can actually wipe you out at the written stage, is you're not going to change the face of the law. Um, you don't have anything really to offer the judge. Sorry, it's harsh, um, but it's true. And one of the most, um, that, that's particularly so at the high court, I think it's probably true at every level. You're a recently graduated young law student. You might be really smart. You're not smarter than a judge. And so emphasising in your cover letter how much assistance you're going to provide with the law is probably going to get you wiped out um, because it's going to suggest that you're insufferable. So I think just try try to be a little bit humble. I know people, like it's really difficult in a cover letter. Um, obviously emphasise that you're good and you know your stuff, but don't sit there being like, well, I know that your honour has a civil law background and I am actually really interested in criminal law, so I'll be able to offer you great assistance when you sit on criminal cases. That is just, it's just not, and someone has done that. Just don't do it. Um, I think that's probably my biggest tip is accept that um, the job is really to help you less so than to help them in a weird way. Yeah. And I, I might add on that too, be humble, not just with respect to your judge, but show that you can be humble um, with respect to all people you'll be working with in the court, um, even people who you may be in some ways, you know, formally senior to um, because, you know, you've got a degree and they don't. That's the, the questions that the judges are asking me is, you know, are, are, am I going to be able to get along with them? But also, you know, how are they going to treat the rest of my team um, as well? So here's a question, and I'll just open it up to the panel now. So panellists, just jump in if you feel you can answer it. Do judges take older graduates uh, as associates or does it tend to be 20-somethings? Anyone want to jump in on that? Definitely in the High Court, um, almost exclusively they will take, I mean, it's still 20 something, sorry. So maybe that doesn't quite answer the question, but it's more like 27, 28 somethings rather than 24, 25 somethings. And also actually people, um, a few of the people that I worked with were in their thirties. And that's just because, um, you know, it's a competitive process. And so most people who sort of make it over the line have got a few other things under their belt. Um, but my experience at the at the um, Supreme Court is that it's generally recent, recent graduates. Um, within a year or two, generally. Yeah. yeah. And look, I, I have, um, I mean, I've worked as a litigator with associates who are, um, you know, fr from from what I could tell, much older than their their 20s, so that seem to be in their 30s or 40s. So I don't think it's, it's unheard of. Um, and I certainly wouldn't have thought that would be a criteria that judges would, would focus on um, in any way. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on that? Or if not, I'll go to another question. Okay, another question is, what are some of the career prospects following an associateship? Because I understand these positions are usually for a short duration. Um, so, so yes, um, what do you do after? Uh, so, yes, most associateships go for anywhere between a year to, I've heard up to two years, but I think it's more a year, 18 months. Um, what are your career prospects following that? I think it's kind of like anything with the law. You can do 
anything after this. There's no set path. You don't have to become a barrister. You don't have to go back to a firm. You might do an associateship and go, hell, law's not for me, you know? Like, it's really up to you, whatever you really think. Um, it definitely, I have found that there's more of an inclination towards people who are at least interested in the prospect of the bar, um, becoming an associate or a tip staff, because you do get that unparalleled access to seeing good and probably more valuable bad advocacy and what not to do, you know? So I've found there's probably more of an inclination towards that. I know that's personally where I would like to be heading, uh, you know, seeing this is kind of reaffirmed and I've said, I'd love to go to the bar. I found, find that more fascinating than the business structure of a law firm. But again, I think really it's, it's a choose your own adventure. You can do this and decide I've had, you know, friends that have done this and then gone into policy or they've stayed within the court system and become registrars or, you know, gone and worked in the registry. So really it's kind of whatever you want to do. Um, and I would add um, those people who are interested in going off and doing an LLM or a PhD overseas in one of the big, you know, famous universities overseas and looking for a scholarship to do that, uh, being a judge's associate is, a, you know, a beautiful line on your CV because you're also in the position of asking your judge for a reference. So that's also, um, from what I've observed, quite a common pathway to going from a judge's associateship to a Rhodes Scholar to, you know, a doctor, an academic doctor, I mean, and then then into academia. But look, I've um, this is a great question. How do you address your judge in person? Um, so Maddie, how did you address your judge in person? Um, I always called her judge. But now I have stopped being her associate. She told me I could call her by her first name. So it's like a weird formality. But also I thought that it, it helped me maintain that like aspect of formality in our relationship by calling her judge. I, yeah, I appreciated it. Excellent. Does anyone else want to jump in on that? Uh, Justice, it's Chief Justice. Which, or Chief. Or Chief. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, once you're a bit more comfortable, which is quite long, um, but otherwise the, the High Court is judge um, as well. Okay. Excellent. And um, so we've got a good one here. Wondering, this is a good question. Wondering if you found the associateship most beneficial straight after graduating or after a couple of years of practice. So I think maybe, Alexander, we might go to you. And we'll do you and then Kate, because I understand you sort of went, you are in litigation first. And Kate, I think you went straight after university. Is that right? So Alexander and then Kate. I really liked um, having some experience under my belt as in terms of like working in a corporate firm because it kind of all clicked in a different way for me. Um, I was able to kind of understand the processes and kind of the lingo that goes into working in a court or working in law in general really a little bit better because I had some, you know, I had two years of working experience in a firm. I also found it really valuable at the moment when you receive, this will sound really silly, but when you receive something like a physical court book, I actually know what work went into that as a junior solicitor and how many hours they spent paginating all those pages. And so it's, it's kind of nice to kind of appreciate the work that goes into things and then see how it works from a chamber's perspective of what was previously you know, completely mystified and unknown to me. So I really enjoyed having that experience. I was able to kind of come in with a bit more ground knowledge, I felt, um, in terms of, like I said, the lingo or even the way the court processes worked. Um, so that kind of benefited me. That's the kind of experience I wanted. And Kate, what did you, uh, how did you find it going straight from university um, to an associateship position? Um, well, I, I've really seen there's been benefit for me in coming uh, straight from university in the sense that I um, was quite generally interested across a lot of areas. Uh, so being able to go um, straight to an associateship has meant that I've been able to say, okay, I think this is not for me, but I think this area might be for me rather than going to um, work for a firm, for example, for a whole year in an area of law that I may not be at all interested in. So it's a good way of sort of testing the water in a lot of areas by coming straight into it. Um, there were certainly times at the start where I thought, oh, I wish I had um, maybe done a year um, at, you know, at a, a larger firm, for example, and learned a bit more about certain things because I didn't uh, know um, all the court processes, for example, straight away or um, various things. But then but there were certainly things that were very easy to pick up and didn't um, didn't prevent my enjoyment out of the process um, of the associateship at all. So yeah, I was able to pick things up quite quickly um, and you have quite a good 
working relationship, um, at least in the chambers that I was in with the other associate. And um, I just asked a million and one questions and tried very hard to get on top of those difficult things at the start. And it meant that the, after that, um, it was nice and smooth. Excellent. And there's a question here. And just, Maddie, I'll put it to you very quickly because you might be the best person to answer it. It says, so if you've, if you've practised for a little while, so you've graduated, you've practised, is it a problem if you've specialised in a particular area? I didn't find it problematic for me. Oh, I mean, it was an adjustment at the start because um, at Freehills, I work in insolvency and restructuring and they use totally different terminology to what they use in the district court in criminal law. Um, so, yes, it's an adjustment, but I think that a lot of law is applicable across the board. A lot of the skills you pick up in one area is applicable in another. Um, it also helps you see a different area of law that you're not working in. And I had no problem telling my employers that I was going to go work for a criminal law judge. They they were like, yeah, power to you, go and try a different area of law. And even if they're not understanding in that way, they'll still be able to appreciate that an associateship or a tip staff position is beneficial no matter what area of law you're working in. Like you see the court processes, you pick up so many skills and get to just watch court every day. So like it's very rare that an employer would say no to you taking that experience, even if it's in a different area of law. Thank you. So I've got I've two questions that I'll probably put to Jessica and Naomi. Um, the first one is a very, um, very short one. In your cover letter, is it acceptable to address a judge with you or your or should it always be your honour? So that's the first question. And the second question is, um, so between once you've graduated, here we go, what sort of experiences should you try to get under your belt in between graduating and then applying for an associateship? Um, so Jessica and Naomi, I'll go to you with that one. Uh, so for the letter, it would just be dear judge or dear chief justice, if, if as the case may be, um, and then it would just be you. I, I, I don't think you would need to write your honour in writing. It's like, like a, yeah. Yeah, I think you could though. You could, um, but I don't. I don't. I don't think you definitely wouldn't be penalised for for not putting your honour. No. Um, yeah. um, you would be penalised for saying dear Tom. That yes. Would be. <laughs> really inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then in terms of the, um, sorry, in terms of the, uh, um, what was the, the second question, question um, what was that? The, what are the experiences? So between graduating and applying for an associateship, what are, what are some sort of experiences you can get under your belt? Um, what should you get under your belt? I mean, I think, it, and actually linking back to something that, someone said at the very start, which was, you know, try and figure out while you're at law school what you want to do. Be aware that it's okay if you get to the end and you have no idea. I certainly didn't. Um, and in my letters, I certainly wrote honestly that I don't know what I like. I like everything. Um, I want to come and work for you to figure out what I like. So you, you, I don't think you'd be penalised for doing that if, if that's the honest truth. I mean, if you have a particular interest, that's fine. Um, so in one sense, I think it's almost a good place to go if you don't know what to do because you'll go there and learn. I think Maddie said that as well. So if someone said, oh, Kate, sorry, said that. Um, you'll see a whole bunch of different things and you might figure out where to go. If you um, are sort of struggling to get an associateship straight out of uni and you want to go do something else first, um, I mean, the sky's the limit, really. You could go to a firm, you could go to legal aid, you could go to a community legal centre, you could... I don't know that there's anywhere, um, I mean, certainly for the High Court, maybe go and do an overseas master's. Um, it's not a prerequisite, but. Mm. What yeah, I say? think, yeah, similar, kind of anything that um, I guess would just give you kind of some practical experience um, that's, you know, whether that is in a firm or at the Aboriginal Legal Service or something like that, um, you know, something that you could say, you know, has, has some skills that are transferable across, perhaps. But I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Okay, so look, it is just after seven. So uh, panellists, if any of you do have to log off, I completely understand. Um, if you have a few more minutes, so we've got two questions that I'll put to you and you can decide if you want to answer one of them. One is, I think, a really good one. How have you dealt with the rejection through the application process? I think that's a really great question. 
Um, and another one is, is it better on your resume to have a few in-depth experiences or to have several more diverse experiences? So, um, uh, sorry, I, pro I probably can't take any more questions now. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, but um, so those two questions, how do you deal with rejection? And then, you know, what is it better to have a few diverse experiences or a few sort of more um, focused experiences on your CV? Does anyone want to come in on one of those questions? Um, just on the rejection question, I really think it's very rarely personal. Like I saw so many applications throughout my year um, to my judge and they were just either the wrong time or, you know, she already had someone else in mind for the next role. It's don't, don't see it as a reflection on yourself, your skills. And I think keep trying probably like, don't let it get to you because that's the worst thing you can, you can let rejection do to you. Um, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I agree with what Maddie said. I think, um, you know, I've seen a lot of similar applications and, you know, so many are so qualified and would do the job so well. And, you know, a lot of it just comes down to luck um, and to, you know, whether for whatever reason one particular application stands out a little bit more or whether you gel a little bit more with a particular judge. And um, I, that would definitely be my advice would just be to keep applying because um, there's you hear lots of stories of people, you know, getting um, knocked back from lots of judges and then, and then applying to, you know, the what they think is, you know, the final judge and, and getting it and having a great, great experience. So um, just, just keep, keep trying. Yeah. I think we were saying beforehand how to get an associateship lock and timing. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. obviously everything else we've spoken about as well, but at the end of the day, I mean, even where you end up in your career is luck and timing. Um, do your best, but yeah, it's yeah. not bad. And I'd like to say, like, being a judge's associate, you know, I'm sure is is a wonderful experience and it opens up a lot of doors, but it's not the be all and end all. It's not, you know, please don't feel that um, if, you know, you might decide after this session we've had that it's not really for you. It's not something you're interested in or you may try your luck and you may not get one. Please don't think that that, you know, it, in any way is going to shine a shadow over your career. I didn't do a judge's associateship um, and, you know, I'm really happy with my career. It's taken me lots of wonderful places. The whole idea behind this panel is to... Um, you know, try and make the process a little bit less opaque to try and give you a bit of advice about what is the role, how do you apply, what makes a competitive application. Um, but it's definitely not something that's going to make or break your career. Absolutely not at all. Um, so look, I um, I think we have to finish now because we are over time, but thank you so much uh, for, um, for, um, for the uh, for attending for your questions I know I haven't been able to get to all of the questions I there are some very very specific questions on the Q&A so specific questions about specific judges for specific panelists I might if it's okay um, just ask you to email um, the particular associate so you could find their emails on the the court website um, and you can directly ask those questions I hope that's okay with the the panelists because there are some very very specific questions here so that's what I would um, encourage you to do um, thank you very much I and thank you very much to our panelists for coming along giving up their time um, this is you know the evening for them so they're either um, giving up time working or giving up time with their friends and family um, to come back and, and give back to the college in a, in a really um, meaningful and helpful way so thank you so much and um, thank you everyone for joining and I hope you found it helpful and if you've got any feedback uh, good or bad please please email me because it'd be great to run a session like this every year thanks very much